Tonight's third Thursday lecture is extra special because you get to hear from Jenkins' very own Steve Wright. Steve is the Director of Horticulture and Curator of Plant Collections at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. Besides managing Jenkins' nationally accredited collection of rhododendrons and azaleas, Steve specializes in ecological gardening using native plants of the Eastern United States. His main horticultural interests are plant and animal interactions, native plants, and environmental stewardship. Steve holds an MS in forestry and entomology from Louisiana State University and a BS in agricultural education from Delaware Valley University. We can't wait to hear from Steve tonight. So at this point, I will turn things over to him to get us started. Hi, Steve. Hello, thank you, Amy. So let me share my screen here. Looks good. All right, good evening out there, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for turning, tuning in to hear me talk about the ecological horticultural practices at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm a little hoarse tonight, <clears throat> so I apologize. I'll take lots of sips of water. But the ecological value of plants is something that I'm quite passionate about, um, something that I've talked a lot about over the years, and something that I think will probably be pretty apparent throughout this presentation. Um, we've worked pretty hard to improve the ecology of the Arboretum for many years, and I'd like to share some examples of the work that we have done, talk about some of the things that we're going to do, and also talk about how we go about making some of the decisions that we make in the garden. So the title slide here is a photograph that I took on Azalea Hill this, this past May. And, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful photograph, beautiful azaleas, but there's really nothing about this photograph that screams ecological value. Yeah, there are some bees that occasionally visit uh, evergreen azaleas, but they're not really thought of as an ecologically valuable plant. So the reason I share this though, is because I feel like this is what people envision when they think about Jenkins Arboretum. And for good reason, as um, Amy just mentioned, we have a nationally accredited collection of rhododendrons and azaleas, probably about 5,000 different individual plants just bursting with color the first half of May. But what people don't recognize as much is how much of the ecological work that we've been doing um, at the Arboretum using native plants. And what's interesting about this is I don't see these two things as mutually exclusive. You know, we can have this amazing rhododendron collection as well as an ama amazing native plant collection. In fact, going all the way back to the Arboretum's first site master plan, it was recommended that in addition to our rhododendrons and azaleas, we would do brown covers, underplantings, and companion plants that were all native to the Eastern United States. So more recently, we've been going through some more planning processes. We have finally updated our site master plan after almost 50 years. And we've also gone through a strategic plan. And throughout these plans, we sort of identify who we are and kind of define who we are, where we wanna go and who we wanna be. And one of the main things that came out of these conversations was that we decided that as an organization, we would position ourselves as a model of and leader in ecological horticulture and environmental stewardship. So what does that mean? What is ecological horticulture? Well, there are a lot of ways to define this. Uh, a very simplistic way to define it is gardening in harmony with nature. That's Mount Cuba's definition. I think it's a fine definition, but it could certainly be broken out a little bit more than that. So I'll share another one. So the Ecological Landscape Alliance says that ecological horticulture is a method of designing, building, and maintaining landscapes that considers the ecology of a site and creates gardens that enhance the surrounding environment for the benefit of humans and all other life in the ecosystem. Found another definition that said ecological horticulture is awareness and consciousness of gardening practices and how they affect the natural world from the things that we can see like birds, bees, butterflies to the things that we can't, like soil microbes and carbon sequestration, and then doing the most that we can to improve that natural world. 
my definition is intentionality. And that's a word that I use a lot here. Um, intentionality in plant selection and gardening practices that enhance the beauty of the garden while protecting and improving the ecosystem. So there are cer certainly some common themes through here, benefiting humans, the beauty, but also thinking about all the other life that is out there in the garden. So before I dive into all of this, I want to give you a little overview of the Arboretum's property. Um, you've probably read that the Arboretum is 48 acres. And while that is true, there are 48 acres that's owned by Jenkins Arboretum. The public garden is only about 15 of those acres. So you can see here outlined in black is the public Arboretum, which means most of the property is not open to the public um, for a variety of reasons, mostly because we just haven't had staff uh, over the years to actually get out into some of these other areas and work in them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we have been doing in some of these other areas. I also want to talk about the deer fence. So the area that is surrounded now in yellow um, is where we have a deer exclusion fence, which means, you know, we could do a lot of things inside this yellow space that we couldn't outside the yellow space because of the deer and the really heavy deer brows that we see outside. So the first space I want to talk about is the floodplain. It's about a one acre space between the stream at the bottom of our hill and Devon State Road. Um, it's a very long, skinny tract of land. And for many years, it was just left to go unmanaged and unmaintained. Of course, when you have a natural area that is left unmanaged, then it just becomes overwhelmed with invasive species. In fact, this was a space that many years ago, the staff used to just refer to as the jungle because it was pretty much impassable. You couldn't walk through this space um, without climbing on your hands and knees, crawling over top of or underneath branches. And then we started to restore this space. This was the first restoration project that we did um, in my time here. Um, and so we, we just went through and started cutting out all of the invasive species. And it took two or three years with many different groups of volunteers, corporate volunteers, Boy Scouts, uh, to go through and cut out. And it was it was pretty much all of the typical invasive shrubs, honeysuckle, multiflora rose, and so on. And then in 2015, uh, we started to replant this whole space. And I, I love this picture, and I point out this willow tree because you're going to see it in the next slide. But in less than 10 years, this space has been completely transformed. There are no invasive species. We do keep up with it. And all of the plantings that we have done have filled in beautifully, probably more beautifully than we could have expected. I point out that same willow tree. It doesn't even look right. But um, if I go back, you can see the, the two little shrubs in the foreground have some colored ribbons. Um, those had just been planted. And those are the plants that you see there on the left. They were button bushes, pretty appropriate for a floodplain. So that was one of the restoration projects that we've been working on. And at this point, we're just maintaining. So another one is what we refer to as the Browning Hillside. So this is adjacent to the public garden. You can see this space from the public garden, but you're not currently allowed to go into this space yet. We do sometimes lead tours through there. So the Browning Hillside many years ago, about hundred years ago was a horse pasture and the horses eventually went away and then the pasture would just let go. And when you let a pasture go like that, you end up getting, again, a lot of invasive species, a lot of really terrible vines, poison ivy, grapevine. And this is what the space sort of turned into. You see an old corn crib there as well. And it stayed like that for decades until the mid-1980s when our director realized that it was just too much to try to tackle. You couldn't possibly pull all of those vines. And he actually had this whole hillside scraped with a bulldozer. In fact, you can still see the piles of soil on the other side of this field. So it sat like that for 30 years as mowed grass. So he realized that throwing down some grass seed and mowing it was a lot less work than having to deal with all those invasives. Of course, we recognize that there's very little ecological value in turf grass. Uh, and we're also starting to have some pretty significant stormwater management issues with water sheeting off of this hillside. So we decided in 2015, 2016, that we would reforest this space and start planting trees. After we got through planting about 75 trees and shrubs, we realized then that we were going to have to mow around every one of those little trees and shrubs. 
So then we decided to do an underplanting with high value, high ecological value perennials. And this is what that same space looked like. Uh, this was last summer. And it sort of turned out that we fell in love with all of these high ecological value perennials and have started to remove some of the trees and shrubs that we had originally planted. Um, so I think a lot of people realize that we do have some beehives and we we do harvest the honey. So a lot of the plants that were planted on, in this space um, were planted there to support those bees. The next space that we tackled was this area here in purple. Uh, again, this was along Devon State Road. This was outside of our deer exclusion fence. So we had to be very creative in our plant selection. And this is what the space looked like uh, standing on the side of Devon State Road. What you see here is a, a Boy Scout who was working on his Eagle Scout projects. And we had cleared about a 35 foot strip in from the road. Again, this was complete solid invasive species, mostly multiflora rose and wine berries. Um, we cleared it all out. And then his project was actually to do the replanting of the space. So once again, I want to point out a couple of plants. So you can see the star there on that one tree. And then there are three tiny little trees that we had planted. Uh, and again, this was 2018. And this is what the space looks like now. You can see the star is on that same tree. You'll notice that there are some trees missing. Those were ash trees, and they also come to emerald ash borer. But you can see how large the pawpaws have gotten. And we also have done a lot of additional plantings of perennials along that roadside, all completely deer proof. I'd be happy to share with anybody the list of plants that we put out there. But in addition to being deer proof um, and pretty, we planted a lot of things that were very valuable to wildlife, especially bees. So then you look at the rest of this map, and you realize that more than half of our property is actually outside of that deer exclusion fence in areas that we just refer to as conservation woodlands. And there's a seven acre tract that is contiguous with the public garden, but then there are almost 20 acres that are across Devon State Road. And right now we haven't really done a lot with the areas across Devon State Road, but we've done a lot of work in this seven acre tract of conservation woodlands uh, first step in restoration uh, in that area was to start planting trees. And we did this probably about six or seven years ago. We started planting trees out there, but because there was no deer exclusion fence, we had to cage everything that we planted. And then in 2021, we finally extended our deer exclusion to include that seven acre parcel. And the results have been remarkable. Um, not unexpected you know the picture on the left was taken before we put the deer fence up picture on the right was one year later you can see the spice bush has finally had a chance to really start flushing out new growth um, before that you know the deer would come in and nibble off pretty much any little bit of new growth that these plants were putting out so that was one year after the deer exclusion fence went up and this was this year so three years later you know, these shrubs that had suffered and struggled for years had finally had their chance to take off. And you can see they're probably about eight feet tall now. It was also wonderful to see how much natural regeneration was happening out there just on its own without us doing any planting. There were hundreds of little trees that were popping up all over that hillside. So you see here, there's four different species, a red maple, a sassafras, a black gum, and a witch hazel. But it wasn't just trees that we were seeing. We even found a couple of large patches of trilliums growing wild out there. This was a large patch of very large, very old plants. And it was fascinating because we had been working out there for a few years and never even noticed them. And we suspect that they may have gotten nibbled by the deer, which is why we didn't notice them every year. And we just happened to stumble across them one year. We did put a big fence all around this patch. And now we're starting to see a lot of other native wildflowers popping up out there, like this bloodroot. So in addition to all of the things that are happening naturally out there, we have been planting um, quite a bit, actually. So you can see we planted about 50 trees before the deer fence went up. But again, we had to cage them. And over the next couple of years, you know, we planted close to 500 more. So we've planted over 500 trees and shrubs in this space. Um, so it's it's going to be remarkable, 
looks remarkable already, but um, we are hoping to eventually expand the public garden out into this space. Um, so looking forward to that down the road. You see here also uh, the species that we used. The American hollies were used as screening because there are houses sort of surrounding all of that space. Um, and then we planted pink a lot of pink bloom azaleas. These weren't originally intended for that space, but um, we ended up doing a project in a different space where we had to dig a bunch of azaleas out. So instead of just potting them or planting them somewhere else, we planted them out there. So in order to do a lot of this planting, we had to do a lot of removals. So not just the roadside um, was invaded, but this entire hillside was invaded with some fairly large trees. These were mostly Norway maples and bird cherries that were a little bit too big for us, for our staff to handle. But last winter, we did a staff workshop um, with a certified arborist to learn how to use the chainsaw, drop trees safely and so on. And we went out and marked and dropped all of these old Norway maples that were just filling up space. And whenever we do cut down an invasive tree like this, we treat it with an herbicide. And I know that there's a lot of debate and concern about using herbicides and I totally understand it. But um, if you don't treat these cut stumps with herbicide, what happens is they start sprouting and they end up growing back and it's all sort of been for naught. So we do treat everything every woody plant that we cut down with an herbicide to prevent this. And this is just a lot of down woody debris. In addition to all the trees that we dropped, um, this is actually remnants of a storm that knocked down a whole bunch of trees up in this one space. And so there's a lot of just logs and branches laying all through the forest out there, but it's wonderful. We intentionally left them. We didn't want to chip them up. We didn't want to haul them away. We wanted to leave them there because there is a ton of ecological value in leaving dead trees and logs laying on the ground. And you see here, there's a whole bunch of different organisms that are utilizing these downed logs. In addition, so these are some of the Norway maple logs that we left. But in addition, I recently learned that the population of salamanders is about 10 times higher than we previously thought. Salamanders live under rotting logs. And so by leaving this kind of stuff, we're actually providing a lot of habitat for salamanders and other insects that might be living under those. So it's not all about the birds, bees, and butterflies. You know, sometimes we're we're doing things for other creatures as well. So we realized as we were doing the work out there that we really needed to be able to, to haul things out through this space. And so we you know, we have a, a four-wheel drive tractor, a small lawn tractor um, that can drive in the space. We often carry buckets of water, buckets of mulch um, as we do all these plantings. And so we created this trail system out there. Um, at the moment, this is just a sort of temporary trail system that we use to work from. But we also had an opportunity to then utilize some of these downed logs because there was a, another Boy Scout that reached out to us and said that he would like to complete his Eagle Scout project at Jenkins. And we thought, wow, what a perfect opportunity to kind of tidy the space a little bit, leave all of them in place, but also mark out this trail system. And you see here is a section of the trail. So they just used all of that, the branches, sticks, and logs, roll them up along the edges. So again, we're still leaving all of these out there. They're still going to decompose and provide all that ecological benefit. Um, they're also you know, perpendicular to that slope. So a lot of them are slowing down some stormwater as well. As much as possible, we try to leave snags. This is something that's very tricky when you're in a public space like Jenkins or, or any other public garden to leave dead trees. Um, but there is enormous wildlife value in leaving dead trees if you can do it and if you can do it safely. Um, this is actually a, a big white oak that's at the bottom of the hill in the public garden. But the way it's positioned, we don't think that it's going to fall you know, anywhere where, where people would be. Um, and so this tree died a couple of years ago. And instead of just taking the whole thing down, we decided to just leave it there as a wildlife snag. So going back out to the conservation woodlands, um, we also host a couple of port blitz days throughout the year. Um, in spring, we always do a garlic mustard pull. If you're not familiar with garlic mustard, you've probably seen this growing on the side of the roads. I have seen it plenty of times. It is one of the worst invasive species that we have growing around here. 
Beard won't touch this, so they're not controlling it at all. There's really nothing that I'm aware of that will really affect garlic mustard. So it's highly invasive. And on top of that, the roots produce a chemical that prevent other plants from germinating. So this is a pretty bad one. So every year we go through and we pull the garlic mustard in this conservation woodland area. In 2014, there was so much of it that it took six hours with 20 volunteers to get through that seven acre tract. I'm really happy to tell you that 10 years later, it only took two hours with 10 volunteers. So we are definitely getting ahead of this. You know, the seed bank is in the ground. It's going to be there for a long, long time, but we're at a point where it's really manageable now. Last year, we also did a, a second spring hort blitz, um, but this time it was to pull mile a minute vine. If you're not familiar with this vine, it's pretty remarkable. It has a root that's only about an inch and a half long. It's about as big around as a hair, but manages to grow to enormous sizes, um, which is, you know, something to be proud of. So uh, yeah, this is what they do. They just climb over top of everything. Um, interestingly, it's an annual vine, drops a lot of seeds. So we try to stay on top of that. I can tell you, if you go back and look at this picture, it is not a fun plant to pull. It has these little thorns all over it. So another common name for this plant is pear thumb. And we've been joined by a number of different school groups that come in to help us manage some of our other invasives. Uh, this is late fall, early winter. I think it was a December day. So all of these evergreen plants that we know are invasive, um, we can rip those out then. So they were worth ripping out some English ivy, some winter creeper vine. This is a euonymus a lot of Japanese pachysandra. So getting all of that out of there so that we can restore and replant. Another project that we worked on um, closer to the public garden, but still just outside of it, is this little space here um, near one of the residences. Um, we had an apprentice a couple years ago that really wanted to do a design project. And we had this little space that had been disregarded forever. Um, again, a lot of random seedling trees, there's a lot of really aggressive native plants like uh, Canada goldenrod. There was a, a lot of Japanese spirea in here, really nothing of value. And so we decided that we would overhaul this whole space. She took the lead, created this whole design, and we thought it would be interesting to do something a little bit different. So instead of our typical planting for the, the butterflies and the bees, that we would create a bird garden and one that was specific to granivorous birds or seed eating birds. So you see her here uh, with all the plants laid out and uh, spent a lot of time doing some you know, research to figure out what the best plants would be for birds. And I thought it was funny that in the end, we ended up choosing plants like asters, echinaceas, and sunflowers. And what was kind of funny is that it turns out that they're also some of the best plants for attracting the bees and some of the best plants for attracting the butterflies. So we kind of knocked out three birds with one stone. Now we're in the public garden again. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is reduce the amount of turf that we have, um, partly so that reduces the workload of mowing everything, but also again, that ecological value. Um, turf isn't really providing much ecologically. So in the fall of 2022, this is down by our pond, we decided to take out this strip of grass that was very challenging for us to mow anyway. It was very slick. And then we replanted that space with colonizing natives, Clethra, Spirea, um, Virginia Sweet Spire. <clears throat> and there were other little strips of grass along trails that we decided to take out and then replant those strips with some smaller spring flowering plants. This was a larger project. I took this picture probably about three weeks ago. Um, larger project down near our pond again. This was all turf. And just last week, we planted the whole thing. So again, just eliminating as much turf as possible and increasing the amount of plantings for ecological value. A couple of years back, we had another apprentice who was also interested in doing uh, design using native plants. And we had this very large perennial bed above the pond that had become kind of a beast. Uh, there was a lot of really aggressive plants in there. 
they were very good plants, but they were super aggressive. It was really hard for us to maintain the space. They're also very large, so you couldn't kind of see over top of anything. And we decided that it was time to just start start over, start from scratch. We removed everything from this bed, prevented anything else from coming up, and then we redesigned the whole space and replanted it all. So this was a project that was supported by the Chester County Beekeepers Association. Um, they provided the funding for us to buy all of these plants. And this was about a month ago or so, I took a picture roughly in the same spot. Um, we did actually do another round of planting in that space um, just this morning. Another thing we do at Jenkins is we take an integrated pest management approach to managing diseases and insect pests. Um, it's a pretty common term at this point, but it has a lot of definitions, but I kind of just define it as effectively managing pests using the least toxic approach. So as part of that IPM program, we decided to write our own guide. So. Um, you know, one of our fellows or our apprentices took the lead on helping us to write this pest management guide. And I'm just showing you an example here, a fire blight, which is something that we do see here at Jenkins. You see what we do to monitor and scout, and then it lists out all the different treatment options. So it fills up that whole pyramid. So starting with the least toxic, which is cultural, all the way down to conventional or chemical um, treatments such as a fungicide. There's a whole calendar here. It tells us what we should be doing and when regarding this pest. Then it also says that our preferred treatment for this particular pest is actually to prune the branches out. So this is has a very low toxicity. Um, we could control this with spraying, but it's just not necessary unless you get to the point where there's so much that you'd be pruning off too much that it would actually damage the tree. We're also very precise when it comes to applying any sort of chemicals, herbicides, pesticides. Um, this is actually a needle tipped bottle that we will use near our pond. Whenever we have to cut something down and actually kill it, we will dab a tiny little bit of herbicide on each of those cut stems. So we're not out there doing these large sprays or kind of dripping uh, herbicide on other things. I will tell you that Japanese stilt grass has been a bear to control, especially in the conservation areas, that little seven acre area of conservation woodlands. Um, and sometimes you have to use some chemical measures to get yourself to a place where you can use some of the, the lesser toxic me measures. So out in our conservation woodlands, we do use a product called Fusilade. So Fusilade is something that kills only grasses. You can spray this over top of sedges, you can spray it over top of trees, shrubs, and it won't hurt anything except those grasses. So being very aware of what your options are and selecting the right product is also part of that pest management strategy. So we're doing the least amount of damage possible. And I'm happy to say that last year we had to spray an awful lot to get the stilt grass under control. This year it was about one tenth of what we used last year. And I think we're getting pretty close to being able to just hand pull at this point. So that's a big success. We do try to avoid using systemic insecticides. Um, these are uh, ash trees, probably white ash trees. And you're probably aware that the ash trees have been dying recently because of emerald ash borer, which is an insect that bores into the, the cambium layer and, and kills the tree. Well, you can control that insect with a systemic insecticide. The problem I have with using a systemic insecticide is that it kills everything. You know, it doesn't select for that one pest like the fusillade selected for the stilt grass. It kills everything. And I know that bees um, are especially fond of pollen from ash trees, even though it's a wind pollinated species. Um, the pollen is very valuable and the bees do collect it. So we would be poisoning all of the bees that were attracted to those flowers any other insects, any caterpillars that might have been eating those leaves are going to also be killed. And so we've stopped using systemic insecticide um, on ash trees, and we know that eventually they will succumb. We also don't use poisons. And, you know, sometimes I really wish we did because <laughs> we have some significant 
uh, issues with, with rodents digging around in our nursery, but we're aware that if you use rat poisons, then it's going to move up the food chain. It's called the toxic food web. So, you know, here it is, the little mice eating the poison, the owl eats the mice, the, the owl dies as well as the mouse. Of course, it's not as simple as this. It's this whole web of interaction with, you know, lower creatures eating the poison, they're getting eaten by something, they're getting eaten by something, and it just continues to move up that chain. So we do not use any poisons. We also, as much as possible, leave the leaves alone. Um, we've actually had some visitors before that commented on how many leaves there were. They were surprised that we left all the leaves on the ground, but we are primarily a woodland garden. Leaves are normal in the forest. And so wherever we can, we leave leaves alone. We blow them into the forest further if they're on top of other plants. But in addition to leaving the leaves, we add more. In fact, we add a lot more. Every year we, we have uh, partnerships with contractors that collect neighbor's leaves and they bring them to us, they dump them. We do chop them up a little bit because we use them as mulch. And uh, you see, this is our system. Um, we have this little contraption we call Jenkinstein because we're doing this around Halloween and, and a little after. And uh, we dump these leaves in the top, gravity feeds down, and we bag all of those leaves. And you can see the large pile of contractor bags back there. They're all full of chopped oak leaves. And we love to keep track of this stuff. We, we just love statistics around here. It's really just sort of for internal fun. But, um, but we do track all of it. And you can see we've gotten pretty efficient uh, with our methods. We only took three mornings. It's not even days. It's just two and a half hour mornings. Um, to bag 831 bags of chopped leaves. And then here are the volunteers spreading those chopped leaves out in early spring. And it's not just leaves, it's other debris too. Anything else that's pulled out of the garden, if it's, there is an easy spot where we can just dump it and scatter it around, we tend to do that. So this is down near the pond. There's a very large grove of old rhododendrons that just has bare ground underneath. So we dumped all of the, the debris from the pond that we were pulling out under here to just rot in place and provide some natural fertilizer for those rhododendrons. We do that also when we cut back our perennial beds in the spring before they start shooting out new growth. And we just kind of tuck things around and hide them as best we can. We use a lot of wood chips. Can't tell you how many loads of wood chips we use every year. Um, that's our primary mulch is wood chips. Um, they last longer than the leaves. And of course, they're adding a lot of nutrition to the soil. They do all the same things that any other mulch would do, but it's a natural product that's going to break down naturally. And one of the great things about using wood chips is they also encourage a lot of fungal growth. So this, you might think fungus in the garden is a bad thing, but this is beneficial fungi. A lot of mycorrhizae are growing out of these wood chips. The mycorrhizae are actually associating with the, the root systems of the plants that we've planted and providing nutrients to those plants. So there are a lot of benefits to using wood chips. Speaking of wood chips, um, some of you will remember the storm that we had in 2020. On top of everything else that happened in 2020, there was a huge storm that passed through in early June. Uh, it was called a derecho, a straight line windstorm. And in that storm, we lost 60 trees. So this was an area below our pond again, where there had been a whole bunch of white pine trees, several of them snapped or tipped out completely. And we basically had to clean up this entire area, take all the trees out. But instead of hauling them all away, we had them chipped in place. So um, we always contract with Shriner Tree Care. They brought all of their chippers and equipment in, sent all of it through, entire trees through the chipper, and left us with these huge piles of wood chips. And we asked them to then just bulldoze those wood chips down over the bank and cover everything up and rot in place. So this is good anyway, but it's especially good because the soil in this space was very poor. This was subsoil from when the pond was dug. So it was very low nutrient, very rocky, kind of clay. And so it really gave us a benefit um, to the soil in this space. So this was summertime 2020. And this was a couple of weeks ago I went out there. It actually looks a bit different than this now. We've been removing some plants and we're going to be doing a large planting in this space um, tomorrow morning. 
we did something similar out into another space. Um, this is in the public area, uh, but it's an area that doesn't have any trails. So um, there were several dead and dying trees out here and um, a couple of misshapen disease trees. So we decided to just take them all down and again, just send them all through a chipper and have all of those wood chips spread out. It was probably about a three inch layer of wood chips all through this one acre space. So this was three years ago. I went out a couple of weeks ago and just kind of raked around in that wood chip layer and picked it up. And this is what was left. So it's basically compost. Um, this is going to be amazing when we finally do put trails out there and do start planting out in that space. So another thing we do um, is a lot of data-driven decision-making. So it goes back to that intentionality that I mentioned, so the intentionality in plant selection. But it's not just decision-making, it's data-driven garden-making. And we do a lot of eco-friendly planting, um, plants that you know we, we put in the garden based on research that we've seen uh, or information from reputable sources. So it often includes plants that you might not want in some gardens, could be some messy plants. A good example would be sweet gum. I'm gonna provide examples of all of these. Maybe some things that are kind of unpretty like a box elder, which is kind of a weedy tree, or maybe some inconsistent Conspicuous plants. Hackberries are a really good example of that, where the flowers and the fruits are both highly valuable, but neither of them are very showy. There are a lot of weedy plants that we allow to grow in some spaces. A good example is white snake root. There are some unfriendly plants that have good ecological value. One of my favorites is devil's walking stick. If you know this one, you'll know that it's not easy to work around. It's covered in thorns, very prickly. There are some that are sort of horticulturally pedestrian, very common, like black cherry. But as you're going to see, black cherry and all of the cherries have extremely high ecological value. So there is value in having them in the garden. And then there's some that just check a lot of these boxes. They're messy, they're weedy, they're unfriendly, they're pedestrian. Stinging nettle is actually a really good example of something that checks all of those boxes, but has high ecological value. There are several different uh, caterpillars whose, I'm sorry, Butterflies whose caterpillars will eat stinging nettle. But as I like to say, every native plant has its place in the ecosystem. Uh, this is one of those weedy native plants that we do actually pull from the arboretum, from the public garden, but that we allow to grow in the conservation areas. This is called Enchanter's Nightshade. And they have the tiniest little white flowers. Most of the plants in this picture have finished flowering, and what you see are the seed heads. And they're, they're terrible. They stick to everything that you, you brush against them. But in order for those seed heads to be there, the flowers had to be pollinated by something. And so this plant is providing some sort of benefit to some insect. Oh, this is a fun story. I've, I've recently learned about the figworts. Um, so what you see here, this is figwort in full bloom, two different species. And uh, I, I have to share this one quote with you because I thought it was quite funny. That figwort is a tall, branching, somewhat ungainly herbaceous perennial whose tiny flowers do not produce a striking display. Well, that is not the biggest endorsement I've ever seen for a garden plant. But notice that is not the end of the quote. So it does not produce a striking di display unless one includes the many bees that are in attendance. Everything that I read about figwort talks about the nectar that these plants are producing and how bees are constantly all over these plants. I read that they're among the most prolific nectar producers in the world. It's a treasure trove of nectar, little cups filled to the brim with nectar, and a tall weed that bears little cups full of honey. So this is a species that we will find a spot for somewhere in the garden because of its value uh, ecologically, not because of its horticultural. Uh, so here is a photograph that I recently took out in the conservation area. Just wanna point out a couple of those weeds that we keep. One of them is blackberry. And we actually keep some pretty large patches of blackberries out there. And the reason for that is because we have learned that the pollen of blackberries and raspberries or the rubus genus really is a powerhouse. It seems like anybody that has done any pollen research that has included rubus has found that they are the best if or near the best uh, quality pollen for bees. 
And so you see they're very high in protein, very high in sugar. Again, this is the pollen is very high in protein, very high in sugar, very high in amino acids, and very high in antioxidants, which is probably why that the, the insects that eat this pollen have an increased lifespan. What's also interesting that I've learned recently is about 30% of our native bees create their homes in pith or in hollow wood or holes in wood. And it turns out that blackberry and raspberry canes are kind of the perf perfect size and have that pithiness for these uh, cane nesting bees. Because of that, we have also changed the way that we have maintained our, our perennial beds. So again, this is down by the pond, and you'll see that we left about 18 inches of the bottom of these old perennial stems because that 30% of bees that may be nesting in there is going to be nesting in those bottom 18 inches. So we remove the tops just in case there's any eggs or larvae in those stems. And it kind of doesn't matter because all of those perennials will grow up and cover up those stems anyway within a couple of weeks. So going back to that same photograph, another plant that's pretty weedy is pokeweed. And we've seen this growing all over the place. Um, it is a weed, but it is a good weed. It is a very valuable weed, and we have left it in a lot of places. So this was the result of probably a two-year-long um, uh, literature review that I did about fruits and uh, compiled this list of what I think are the top 10 fall fruiting plants for birds. And so pokeweed has pretty high um fat content, carbohydrate content, and protein content, it has a high selection rate by birds. So it makes it valuable. You remember that the snag that I showed earlier of the white oak, well, we didn't just leave it as a snag. Um, we had an opportunity to plant something else at the base that would cover that snag that would also be providing food for the birds. And the plant that I chose was Virginia creeper. So they are also very high in antioxidants and have a high selection rate by birds. And this is what those fruits look like. And the picture on the right is actually the selection that I chose for that space. Uh, it's a cultivar called Red Wall. So it should have superior red fall color. So again, it's in improving the beauty of the garden while also improving the ecological value. Oh, this is a fun one. We have been pulling this weed for years. And I was actually on a Facebook page for a plant identification group the other day and saw this, pl this plant posted, clicked on the comments to see if anybody knew what it was, and somebody said, oh, this is willow herb. It's a keystone plant. And my jaw hit the floor. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I had to do a little bit more research. And sure enough, up in New England, um, this is in Vermont, willow herbs, the epilobium species, support 32 species of butterflies and moss. And I was completely unaware of this. Um, it's not a keystone species here. But because I read this, we have decided to leave some patches of willow herb in areas where we're okay leaving it. So I mentioned this term keystone plants, and some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not be, but keystone plants um, are native plants that are critical to the food web and necessary for many wildlife species to complete their life cycles. Without them, native bees, butterflies, and birds would not thrive, and about 96% of our terrestrial birds rely on insects supported by those keystone plants. So you look here, this is actually from Dr. Talame, uh, who's done a lot of this kind of work with actually quantifying the number of different caterpillars, species that are feeding on all of these different trees, shrubs, and perennials. Um, and then uh, Jared Fowler did a lot of work on um, pollen specialist bees, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, I was out in the garden the other day and I, I happened to look up and I saw the top of this tree with just holes all through the foliage. And I realized that this was a cherry tree. This, this is um, a choke cherry. If I go back to this, you'll see that cherries support 340 different caterpillars. And so while I think a lot of people might look at this and say, oh no, something's eating my tree. I think, oh yes, something's eating my tree. That's the, the whole point. But I mentioned the pollen specialist and Jared Fowler. Um, another bit of information that we recently learned that has affected how we manage the garden, um, that sunflowers support 50 different species of specialist bees. And what I mean by that 
is that there are 50 species of bees that eat nothing but pollen from sunflowers. If they didn't have sunflowers, they wouldn't exist. And notice how high goldenrods and asters are. And if I go back to this table, you'll notice that for the flowering perennials, they're also among the best for um, supporting caterpillars. So they're, they're pretty heavy hitters in the garden. And because of this chart, we have started planting a lot more sunflowers in the garden, including Maximilian sunflower, which is the picture here. Another little bit of, of data that we found, um, this was a Penn State trial where over the course of three years, they were uh, monitoring the number of pollinator visits to a bunch of different species that they had in their garden and just notice how many bees and, and other pollinators um, visited Pycnanthum muticum. So this is one of the mountain mints. Um, bees just love mountain mint, partly because it's got good uh, nectar uh, quality, but also because they bloom for a really long time. So this was by far the most attractive. We have planted a whole bunch of mountain mint because of this research. We have planted Solidago rigida because of this research. We have added more Oryngium yuccifolium because of this research. I also just want to talk a little bit about this debate between cultivars and what they call native in this picture, um, but I'm actually going to just call them straight species. A uh, lot of debate about this, but there has been a lot of research also, not enough research, but there has been some research um, to actually you know, quantify the value of some of these plants. And something I will point out with this is, you'll notice that the top half of this is selection. So these are species selections. So somebody found a really interesting individual growing wild. And then there are hybrids that have been crossed together. And you'll notice that between, in the selections, between the straight species and the selection, there really is not a significant preference for one or the other. But among the hybrids, there pretty much across the board was a preference for the straight species. And going back to those selections, there was one exception where there was a significant preference, but the preference was not for the species, it was actually for the cultivar. And the cultivar is lavender towers or lavender term. And this is it. So this is the straight species of Culver's root on the left and lavender towers on the right. Again, after we saw this research, we went out and bought a bunch of lavender towers and we added that to the garden. This is in addition to the others that we have as well. So we do have plenty of straight species. Another good example is Phlox paniculata, the cultivar called Gina, attracts many more butterflies than any other species, or excuse me, any other selection of Phlox. Um, this was according to Mount Cuba's trials, but I can tell you that I see this in the garden as well. There are always butterflies on Phlox Gina. And this is the actual data. So they had volunteers doing counts of butterfly visits to all of the different flocks in their trial. And you can see Gina was far and away more attractive. And then this was the chart for echinacea. So when, when Mount Cuba Center did their echinacea trial, they did the same thing where they, they had people go out and count the number of pollinator visits. And it turns out that a cultivar called Fragrant Angel was the most attractive to bees. Um, not much more attractive than the straight, straight species, but attractive enough to make me want to add the plant to the garden. Something else that I thought was really interesting about this, if you look, they have a, a little symbol next to the top performing plants horticulturally. It's the ones that look the best, and brew the best. Most of the top performing cultivars horticulturally were also the ones that attracted the most pollinators. And you see only one symbol on the right half of this, the ones that attracted the fewest, hor fewest pollinators um, had good horticultural value. And there's Fragrant Angel. One last example of, this is a St. John's wort. So bees love St. John's wort. They're always all over them. And they're just collecting pollen. There's no nectar. So this is Calm's St. John's wort. There is a selection of Calm St. John's work called Gemo. And Gemo blooms for about twice as long as the straight species, which just means that it's providing pollen for a lot longer period of time. So we have started adding Gemo to the garden. So the last thing I want to talk about is our green ribbon program. Just have a few slides here, um, just kind of as a little teaser. So the green ribbon program is something that the Arboretum has been working on for more than 20 years. It's a program that started in 20 or 2003. 
the goal of the program was to promote the greater use of native plants in the home landscape. So this was well before the whole native plant movement started. And in each year, we would select three plants, a tree, a shrub, and a perennial. Later, we decided to add vines and grasses and sedges, but we would always select three plants and we would promote them through publications, pres uh, presentations, social media platforms. And over the last couple of years, we've decided that we would like to revise the Green Ribbon Plant Program um, so that it included high ecological value plants, in addition to those that are horticulturally valued. So some other criteria, they have to be native to the Eastern US, hardy to our region, and commercially available. And again, a lot of the plants that were added to this list were selected based primarily on research data. So these were those ecological considerations that we were looking at when we actually made the new list of plants. Um, is the plant a keystone species? Does it support specialist bees? If it does, how many and how does it rank? Does it provide both pollen and nectar? And if it does, what is the quality of that pollen and nectar? What is the protein content? What's the sugar content? Are there any other factors uh, with the pollen or nectar that we should consider? Is it a host plant for butterflies and moths? And if it is, how many and how does it rank? Does it provide high value seeds or berries? What makes those valuable? Does the plant help reduce erosion or stormwater? And if so, how is it doing that? Is it effective at sequestering carbon? And does the plant support wildlife outside of typical seasonal peaks? And so what this means is there are some plants that bloom very early in the season, maybe March, April, or very late in the season that are supporting the insects that are active at those times um, when there's not much else uh, blooming. And here are a few of the selections from our revised list. Um, we haven't published that list yet, but we are still working on it. So we have a uh, arrowwood viburnum, Top right is purple flowering raspberry, so it's that rubus. Bottom right is gray dogwood. Bottom left is white oak. And with that, I thank you all again for tuning in. You see my email address there is at the bottom here, and you are free to email me with any questions, or I can take questions that you have now. Thank you so much, Steve. Lots of uh, good conversation in the background too. A lot of people are interested in getting more plant lists. And I was actually starting to make a list for myself of the different projects that you've mentioned. We have really good articles about that that have uh, shown up in our magazine. And so I will isolate those articles and add them as PDFs in our resources um, when we send that out to everyone. So our questions take us back to the very beginning. So we'll head back to that planting you did at Devon State Road. As yeah. you mentioned, there were pawpaws. Mm -hmm. um, this person said, are there any pawpaw fruits there yet? I planted some trees three years ago, but I know that it will take about 10 years to have fruit. Fingers crossed. So I haven't actually gone out to check if those trees have pawpaws on them. Um, they are getting about the size that I would expect for pawpaw fruits to develop. Um, but we have seen fruits on pretty much all of the other pawpaws on the property. So there should be. I can go look. <laughs> <laughs> this question, I assume, is when you were talking about all those projects where you were removing turf. Um, how did you get rid of the turf? Um, this person would like to do that at their at their own house. Yeah. So if the area was small enough, we just scraped it off with a shovel. I can tell you that is an awful lot of work. Um, there were some other spaces where we took a weed whacker out and basically just whacked everything right down to the ground. So it was just mud. And I can tell you that's also a lot of work. And it's also very messy because you end up with pieces of dirt and mud and grass all over the place. What we found to be most effective is actually just spraying with, a, with an herbicide, a non-selective herbicide, sort of like Roundup or any other glyphosate product, um, you do it about a month or so before you're ready to start planting. It gives everything enough time to die and actually be able to be raked off. Um, if you don't do it early enough, then even though everything's brown, it's still holding onto the ground pretty tightly. So it ends up being more work. But that's what I would recommend for larger areas especially. Okay, great. So here's another toughie. How do you treat lesser celandine? Uh, 
so a couple of different ways. Um, we have it under control in the public garden. So we will go out and pull it if we can, or use soil knives if we can, if it's a very small patch. Um, we do a little bit of spot spraying with a glyphosate product, sort of depends on where we are, which product that we use. Um, of course, we have to be very careful because they're growing up through all sorts of things. Um, but down in the floodplain along the stream where it's just a solid carpet of it, we don't really manage it at all because it, there's sort of no point in managing it. You know, if you were to eradicate the entire population one year, the next time you had a flooding rain, all of the little bulblets from upstream would just get dropped and they would continue. Um, so it's sort of a losing battle. I'll just say find the areas where you want to keep it under control and just manage it there. You talked about wood chips. This person asks, doesn't new wood chips pull some nutrients from the soil mm -hmm. or need additive nutrients? So that's that's a good question. There's been a lot of debate about that too. Um, as it turns out, as long as as long as you don't mix it into the soil, it's not tying up any nutrition, specifically nitrogen. Um, what happens is as those wood chips break down, the bacteria and fungi are eating up the nitrogen. So if you were to get that into the soil, then it's going to pull all the nitrogen out of the soil. And you don't want that. If you put the chips on top of the soil, then the roots are underneath are not being affected by that bacteria stealing the nitrogen at the top. In fact, I have read, um, I can't remember if this was a research paper or what, but it, somebody was saying that it can actually be beneficial to have those wood chips eating up that nitrogen because it could help reduce the weed pressure because the weeds don't survive. Although I'm not sure I believe. Weeds seem to survive everything. <laughs> why not put the chopped leaves down in the fall so you don't have to bag um we will in some places um but the problem is we usually add a pretty good layer like a three inch layer and over the winter typically we would get snow and then the snow would just pack everything down and we would have to go through and, and rake that all up and so it just and there are other projects going on in late fall, early winter that we have to work on. There's a lot of holidays and uh, we just kind of don't have time to do it all at that time. Do you have Pinellia ternata? If so, how do you treat it? I have a lot in my garden and can't get rid of it. Yeah, so we used to have a little bit um, it was at the end of that very large wildflower bed that we took out. Um, and it was very challenging. You know, it's it's a little bulb. It's related to Jack in the pulpit. And, um, you know, as, as long as you can get it before it spreads, then you can dig it out. You get the little bulbs out. Um, we've done a combination of digging, spraying with a non-selective herbicide. You know, there are some of these weeds that are very hard to dig out, very hard to pull out, and you kind of have to resort to using some sort of chemical measures. So that's what I would recommend. <clears throat> there was another erysema relative that uh, we tried digging out a few years ago, thought we had it all. The next year it was all back. So. Mm -hmm. That's the questions that we have written. Is there any other questions out there? I'll give you guys another, oh, one came in. <laughs> um, Steve, I'm not sure if you know about this soft landing concept, but it says with the soft landing concept under trees, native is best, but is non-native okay? I don't know what soft landing means. So, um, I believe it has it, it talks about the concepts of like leaf mulch and leaf litter in the woodlands and um, some of the caterpillars and pupa as they fall from the tree canopies or come down that they have a soft landings. Um, I, I believe that's the concept she's referring to. I mean, if that is the goal is to provide a soft landing, I don't think those organisms care whether it's native or not native or whether it's leaves or wood chips or anything else. They they might care if they stand up and after their fall and try to eat something. Right. <laughs> yep. 
Yes, I'll do a little more research. I believe Soft Landing um, connects back with Heather Holm, who did our June presentation on uh, native wasps. So I can try to do a little bit more digging on Soft Landings and add that as a resource for folks. What advice do you have for managing ground ivy, particularly where there's tree roots that would like herbicide? So like Creeping Charlie, is that the ground ivy or is it English ivy? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I'm going to assume it's the Creeping Mel Charlie. Melody and Bill, if you're still out there, could you <laughs> write more about the ground ivy? We'll give you a chance to write more about ground ivy and we're going to move on to another question. Um, this is a comment. It says, I've heard that Pacura aria might crowd out lesser celandine. It certainly is tough enough to hang. And what I have seen is that there's very little lesser celandine where there is Pacura, but the celandine tends to come up earlier in the year, a little bit earlier than the Pacura. So I think it, it could still grow up through, but the Pacura holds its own. For sure. And um, if I can make a small plug for our November talk um, is going to address uh, natives that kind of outcompete invasive plants. So um, I can also add information about that with the resources. Any suggestions for getting rid of poison ivy that is in garden beds that won't kill the good plants around it? Pull it every year, but of course it comes back. That's what I was going to say is pull it, hand pull it. Um, you can buy long gloves all the way up to your shoulder. You can buy sleeves and just go on Amazon. You can get these, you know, long plastic disposable sleeves and just pull it. And that's what we do here. Usually in mid to late October, you can see them changing colors. So they're easy to spot. And we'll just go out in the morning with our staff everybody with their, their long gloves on and we just pull it. Mm. Now, poison ivy is a great plant for birds if uh, if it is something that you can't get rid of. Um, Melody and Bill have come back to us. Yes, they were talking about creeping Charlie and they just emphasized that the tree roots would not like herbicide, which I can imagine the tree roots would not like. Yeah, I, I would say do the best you can with hand pulling, um, but a good thick layer of mulch would be beneficial. It would just smother it. Mm. A good point. Smother Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one that we have here, um, have you tackled much poison sumac at Jenkins? It's asking the best way to get rid of poison sumac. We've never had poison sumac here, but it is a shrub. And I would say that you know, what I would do would be to do the cut and paint method like we do the invasive trees where you take a saw or loppers out. You might need a Tyvek suit for that, but, you know, take it out, cut them down, and then do the little dab of herbicide on the cut stems, mm -hmm. and that would kill it. Wonderful. Such great advice tonight, Steve. Thank you so much for being with us. I know this is a very busy time for you and your crew in the garden. Um, so just putting a plug out there for anyone who's local or would like to take a road trip and come visit us at Jenkins. Um, we have a garden shop that sells loads of plants, anything from perennials to shrubs to trees. Um, and right now we're open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the garden shop. And then starting in October, our hours will be 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, but we will be open through at least mid-October, still selling those shrubs and trees. It may even have some leftover trees um, pushing a little bit later in the fall, but um, we are celebrating fall planting week this week at Jenkins because it's such a great season for getting plants in the ground. Um, we need rain desperately, but aside from that, uh, fall is a great season for getting plants in the ground. So please, again, if you're local or want to come uh, take a little trip and come shop, uh, come on over to Jenkins to get your native plants. Again, perennial shrubs, trees, all the good stuff to get into your landscape. So, oh, did more questions come in? Well, wonderful. It's all accolades. So thank you again, Steve, for, for a, a wonderful talk and just a reminder that we are recording tonight and we will send that out to everyone. And I have a long laundry list of resources to share. 
Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us and thanks again, Steve, for your time. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. All right. Good night, everybody.